All right, hi, um, I'm Gray, um, and we're gonna be talking about kind of some of the background and insides of docs.rs. Um, before we get too far, um, here's some information about me. Uh, if you're in the Rust community for long enough, you might recognize me by my alias, Quiet Mischievous. Um, my GitHub sponsors link is on here. I actually just got approved like a week or two ago, um, so that's fun. I'm at the Recur Center right now uh, as a fellow to actually spend three months working directly on this, so that's fun. I'm the lead of the Rust doc team. I'm also a member of the documentation team. Um, I like music, I like docs, I like Rust, and I like y'all. Um, so um, I'm not sure how much of an introduction we need, but for completeness and for the video, um, docs.rs is a lovely little website where uh, anyone who publishes a library on crates.io um, can, um, docs.rs has like a scraper that will like check crates.io uh, every time something releases and build its documentation and hosts it up for everyone to see. Um, and so it's a very lovely community resource that I'm sure a lot of people in this room and beyond have depended upon a lot. Um, but I want to I want to talk about like the where this got started. Um, so back in 2016, uh, someone named Owner Aslan, whose name I probably just butchered, um, wanted to have documentation for everything. At this point, um, there wasn't really anything. There wasn't really any centralized documentation solution. Uh, everyone either hosted their own docs or didn't have a documentation link in their um, library information. Uh, so. Uh, he came from the Perl world and uh, liked how CPAN had documentation for everything. And so he wanted to give this a shot for Rust. Um, it was actually his first Rust program. It started initially as a Perl script, but it blew up to about 800 megs of memory use after a week of trying to build stuff. Um, so uh, he, started a, he started a project called Crates.fyi um, as his first Rust program. and um, it took about 10 days to build all of crates.io, and even after all of that, I was only using about four megs of memory, so it was actually half a percent of the memory use of the original Perl script. Um, but after it had had all of that initial thing, uh, in February 1st of 2016, um, crates.fyi launched to the world. It was extremely basic. It didn't have a front page. The idea was that you could look at a crates.io crate page and change the URL to point to crates.fyi instead, and you would see the documentation. Um, so this was, uh, you know, this caught on for a while, um, but um, someone else in the community had the domain docs.rs and was willing to give it and was just parking it to give it to anyone who wanted to host documentation for Rust stuff. And so after a series of exchanges, um, this project then landed there where it's been ever since. Um, so in the end of August 2016, August 26th, uh, it relaunched as docs.rs uh, with the front page we all know and love today. Um, and it's kind of been there churning out, uh, slowly improving ever since. Um, so I want to give a note about sort of the internal structure of this, because I'm going to harp on one specific thing for the next several slides. Um, initially, docs.rs, or crates.fyi, was on a server donated by EliseWeb. Uh, they have a program where they donate servers to open source projects, and so um, this was kind of going on a donated server for a while. Um, back when this was created, back in 2016, this was before a lot of the web frameworks uh, that we all ha that are around today sort of started. So the only thing that was around was this old framework called Iron. Um, if you've never used Iron, it deals a lot with it. The entire thing is centered around middleware and extending your uh, service using that. Um, and so it's it's not as popular today. I think it's not as actively maintained as some of the other frameworks out today, but um, you know it still works. The builds were run in an LXC container, um, which, if you're familiar with Docker, it's the same kind of like solution, but it's a different like framework for it. Um, and so all the builds would run in that uh, LXC container to sort of sandbox them a little bit. Because um, if you if you think about like how a crate can have a build script and that build build script and basically do whatever it wants, um, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then whenever it generated documentation, it would take those files and save them into a local Postgres database, and it would just have the entire file contents in the database there, ready to serve up. Um, and then for a while, and this is the important part, it used a custom fork of Rustdoc, 
and cargo, uh, because there were a few features that it wanted um, that weren't in the upstream Rust doc that made um, hosting the site uh, a lot difficult. Um, namely, especially like when you generate documentation with Rust doc, there's a lot of like static files that are the same for all the docs. There's like some CSS and JavaScript and font files that are the same for everyone. Um, hosting 10,000 copies of that file for everyone is really wasteful, and so one of the features really allowed to sort of consolidate those things. Um, so a custom fork is cool, uh, especially if you have the know-how to like tinker around with Rust doc and the, the compiler build system and building cargo and stuff, but now you have to rebase your changes if you want to use a newer Rust doc, and Rust doc is actually tied to the compiler. Um, it, it, lives in the same, it lives in the same repo as the compiler, uses the compiler's internal libraries, uh, so now you have to rebase the compiler all the time, uh, and if you pay attention to how people release their libraries, people like to use language features as soon as they come out. Um, so as you, if you kind of think about this, the, you know, some language feature like comes out on nightly initially or hits its initial stabilization, uh, and some library will immediately upgrade now that the feature flag is not necessary or they want to use this feature in their code, um, it won't build because our Rust doc is too old because uh, it's a pain to rebase your, your compiler all the time. So I just want to give a t rough timeline to this. Um, this is a little ro low resolution on the slide here, um, but I'll have my slides online. Uh, the custom compiler was introduced uh, in 2017 on June 2nd. All those stars on the top was every time a new compiler was rebased. So that's only seven times across 16 months. Um, and this is actually a very important time in the history of the Rust programming language, uh, because this is also, especially towards the end of that time, when some of the 2018 features were coming out. So here's some of the handful of really important stuff that came out. Uh, things like associated consts, um, the pin struct, uh, the SIMD structs in the standard library, 128-bit uh, wide integers, um, it's proc macros, repr transparent, the 2018 edition itself. All of these things came out in this time window. And so there were a lot of people coming in to an issue on docsrs's GitHub repo saying, my crate won't build because your compiler is too old. Uh, and to hammer this home, I actually uh, have a little graph here. And maybe I can uh, sort of highlight it out. But um, these spikes here towards the end are where like a new compiler was released and a whole bunch of things were queued up. But if you notice, there's these like slopes here where the build error rate, which is what this graph is, kind of creeps up over time. And that's, that's because there was just a new compiler that was, or the compiler was so old that like new crate, the more crates that came in over time couldn't build. Um, so I just thought this was an interesting graph when I like pulled the data from the database about the build history. Um, to hammer this home. So while this was going on, um, I know in the IDE talk, there was mentioned about stuff happening at the Rust All Hands, but uh, a year earlier in the Rust All Hands of 2018 in February, uh, a handful of people got together among the early Rust Doc team and the DevTools team saying that we want to make DocsRS official. Because remember, all this time, it was just a solo maintained project. It was all owners' um, like work and maintenance and operations work keeping this running. Um, but it wasn't really an official Rust project project. Um, so, but we wanted to kind of work to make it official. And the biggest thing at that time was saying, OK, well, let's at least get it using upstream Rust doc. Um, so we worked on the major features. The two biggest things were uh, this resource suffix, which kind of lets you pool all of the static files that CSS and JavaScript that I mentioned into the same folder and just name them differently depending on what compiler you're using. And then the other major feature that it was using was this, uh, what was eventually called the extern root URL. So if you've looked at um, Rust doc documentation and there's like those function signatures that say like, you know, this function returns a vec of string or a vec of some other type, um, those type names are links out to other crates documentation. Um, and on docsrs, those are actually hard-coded to link to other docsrs documentation pages. Um, and that's this feature at work. Um, so we added that in August. And later on, uh, and in the next couple months, we kind of said, OK, so we have this in place. 
let's convert it over. Um, and this was harder than it sounded because um, setting up a service that tries to build docs for all of crates.io has this custom server environment that it really expects to be there. Uh, it took a while to get off the ground. Um, but um, I actually did a lot of the work on that. I help, was helped out a lot by a fellow contributor whose alias was John Hu. I, I forget his human name. Um, really helped me out kind of getting the um, environment set up, and that really helped out a lot. Um, so uh, around this time, uh, Lee Webb said it was going to stop sponsoring the server at the end of 2018. Um, and so, you know, we were in October, November around this time, and so we have to go, okay, well, let's migrate this to use the Infra Team's, like, AWS account. Let's get the actual server managed by the Rust infrastructure team, um, because they manage the servers for crates.io, they manage um, the file hosting for all the files that you get from Rust up. Um, you know, they were the perfect fit if we're going to make this a, like, project-managed thing to get it on, like, infrastructure managed by the project. Uh, so we actually switched over about a week before Christmas 2018. And um, we had a couple weeks where the other server was still up in case we needed to fall back. But it turned out pretty well. Um, there is a bit of a hiccup, but every we managed to get everything like ironed out. Um, and right at the end of the year, the other server, the old server was spun down, and now we're uh, happily on AWS. Um, so uh, also along this time, there was a lot of discussion between the uh, Infra team and the release team and the Rust doc team uh, to say, well, there's a, lot of, there's a similar thing going on with a tool the release team uses called Crater. Uh, if you're not familiar with Crater, it's a thing that the release team uses to test beta compilers by compiling as much code as it can. Um, this includes everything on crates.io. This includes a whole bunch of public uh, GitHub repos. Um, that are just like tagged with the Rust language that we can just pull down and say, okay, well, let's build this with a new compiler and see if you know, our new compiler is busted. Um, so it uses a standardized Docker container called Crates Build DNV that just has, it's just a standard Ubuntu Docker container with a whole bunch of system dependencies installed in it uh, to try and you know, have as many system dependencies as Crates can, as crates can depend on. Um, and so, we had this manually synced for a while. Anytime we tried to, anytime we needed to install something on docs.rs because the docs wouldn't build uh, because of a missing system dependency, we would then have to pull request to this Docker container to say, "Hey, you need this too, so we can build it on Crater." Um, so earlier this year, a bunch of code from Crater was extracted out to this library called Rustwide, uh, and what Rustwide does is it kind of leverages that container to lets you build arbitrary code in a more in a sandbox environment. So not only do you have it inside that Docker container, but you can also say, I'm giving you a memory limit, and I'm giving you a time limit, and you also can't access the network. Um, and so uh, just a few weeks ago, we actually converted docs.rs over. If you read the Rust blog very uh, diligently, you may have seen a post about uh, docs.rs changes last month. Um, this was us switching this over so that we could have the same environment uh, between docs.rs and crater. Um, so it was a really good maintenance burden that was lifted, um, so we wouldn't have to like keep this parallel list of system dependencies in sync. Um, but also, it allows us to kind of sandbox the builds a little better. Um, so uh, to sort of draw a parallel, the current structure um, Whereas the old docs are, the old docs.rs and crates FYI was on a donated server by LeaseWeb, uh, now we're on an AWS server managed by the Rust infrastructure team. Um, the web server is still been built in iron. It ain't broke. We didn't fix it. Um, <laughs> so um, whereas the old system was running in an LXC build container, which actually was persistent and had all the build artifacts and stuff cached between builds. Um, now we have a Docker build container that's wiped out every time. Um, so you know, if anyone messes with the build container, well, we'll just scrap it and start a new one. Um, and this is managed by Rustwide, so we can have a bit more of a tighter sandbox there. Uh, we no longer store files in the database, because as it turns out, when you have a whole bunch of HTML files and source files in a database, that database gets pretty huge. Uh, when you're storing everything on crates.io. Um, so we pulled all of that out and are saving them on S3, where storage is a lot cheaper, um, and managed to get the database size down and shrink the server some. Uh, and now we're using upstream Rust doc and Cargo 
um, to run the builds, which is now, ever since that changeover, um, now it's updated automatically, whereas it used to be for a while we had to like manually go in and update the <laughs> Rust doc inside the container basically anytime anyone complained that they were using something that was too new. Um, so I don't like to have big conclusion-y wrap-up slides, but I feel like there are a few good things to call out. Um, I kind of want to reiterate, docs.rs, crates FYI, was um, that maintainer's first big Rust project. And I feel like it's a huge success story for the language that it didn't fall over, that it's been able to handle the load that it's gotten ever since it became a really trusted community resource. Um, but like that first line there, something can become accidentally popular before it's ready. Um, but with the right preparation, it can handle it. And so that's why I feel like it's a success story for Rust to be able to say, you know, someone who doesn't have a whole lot of experience with the language can still write something that is performant and, you know, tolerant to a lot of people accessing it. Um, but despite that, it still decayed after a while um, because it was a solo project for so long. It took it took a lot of time, or it took a lot of effort to try and keep it up over time. Uh, it took fresh eyes to kind of bring it back, that rebirth that's in the title of my of, of this talk. Um, especially for something 24-7, like this web service, having multiple people in there is really important. And um, just to hammer it in, part of that decay was burnout. Um, it was a huge pain to rebase the compiler all the time. It was a huge pain to keep up with the build container all the time. It was a huge pain to like keep everything running. Um, and so it, it's really important to like sort of not only manage your code in a, in like a really like clean, structured, performant way, but also the infrastructure around it as well. Um, it's really it's really helpful to be able to anticipate having to keep things going two, three, four, et cetera, years on. Um, and uh, this is all I have. I've got a bunch of links here. All of these projects that I've mentioned are on GitHub. Um, and so if you want to check it out, um, docs.rs development chat also happens on the Rust team's Discord uh, in the pound docs-rs channel. Um, so if you want to come hang out, check out some stuff about what we're working on, um, you're welcome to hang out. Uh, and then those are my links uh, there as well. Um, I came in well under time, but okay. Um, thank you so much.